Or the more. Oh, okay. Who were you? Sorry, Karen. What technicians? It's always an adventure. Uh, so I decided to go over. No, I have to basically say it was smart. Oh, right. Not for us. Not for us. Not for us. Not for us. Not for us.
Oh my gosh. change to the attendance system this year so if you're here last year it's the same just click on the catalyst go through fill out the uh, sheet there and you'll get attendance there's really no change from last year as opposed to the total rehaul we did so um, everyone in the room I know knows this but people on the outside um, if you click on the link you can uh, go through fill this out and you get uh, credit for for watching at the credentials of fellows, maybe intelligence would be something important to look at. This young man is uh, one of our prior fellows and not the most uh, intelligent behavior. <laughs> hereditary? It's hereditary, apparently. Yes, thanks, Gary. And he runs your family as well. <laughs> Get rid of this, would you? <laughs> to welcome everybody back. I hope everybody had a good summer. We don't have time for show and tell what I did this summer, so we need to move on. Uh, one important thing I want to point out, you all got the schedule for the year, and we have three sessions that are not going to be in this room, and everybody is used to coming to this room by force of habit, and then the first one that is not in this room is next week. So this is in the next building over, right, right yeah, true? Just across the way. Yeah. Um, well, what I'll do, since I know you're going to forget what I'm saying anyway, is we'll post somebody in this building and a couple of people along the way to guide you into the right room. Anyway, to look at the schedule, because that comes up with three uh, of our presentations. And uh, the next one is with Jonathan Corrick coming out from UCLA, and he's a great guy, and I want you to get to the right room. Um, the only other thing I want to do before we let Phil Lieberman get started is uh, for our new fellows to introduce themselves, but I only see one of our fellows. But Sydney, you want to just stand up and say who you are? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sydney Long. I am one of the new fellows this year. I am originally from California. I trained in uh, Nashville at Vanderbilt and uh, in internal medicine. Happy to be here. Yeah, I don't know what Dan is. Um, 
but I presume he'll be here shortly. Yes. He's going to present. That's the other thing. After uh, Dr. Lieberman's presentation on idiopathic anaphylaxis, for anybody who can stay either online or in person, uh, we're going to present him a case and maybe run on for another half an hour or so. So the word of the day for a CME credit is Tennessee, which is where our guest speaker came from. He may want to expound on that some. But I want to get him started, so it's really an honor for him to be here, for us to host him here today. Um, he's going to give us a talk on idiopathic anaphylaxis. Oh, one other thing. I'm sorry, I forgot. He's giving a dinner presentation tonight as well, and I welcome your attendance. We all know, unfortunately, with the pharma regulations, but I know that he's crafty and wise enough that he'll make it in a valuable presentation this evening, even with the pharma guidelines. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thanks for the introduction. And yeah, I, I, I was a candidate for the, for the uh, talk tonight. I had to make the representative get up at 4 a.m. He lives out here. I'm staying out at the airport because I have to leave in the morning at 7. He must have gotten at 4 a.m. to pick me up to be here, so I want to formally thank Mr. Bracken for that. Uh, the, uh, also, I'm so, so sad uh, you hired someone for Vanderbilt to do your uh, fellowship. Uh, Vanderbilt is our sister institution, and uh, there's a constant rivalry uh, between Vandy and the University of Tennessee. Uh, but uh, I, I hope you're an exception to the quality of what they normally put out. Uh, just please. Uh, this, this talk this morning, uh, is um, been a topic that's been my passion since I entered the field. Uh, I don't want to tell you when I entered the field, but I will tell you that I'm four years older than, than all who is already ancient. <laughs> um, and uh, the first lecture I ever gave uh, after I, when I entered my fellowship was in uh, September. Uh, almost exact date in 1969, and I lectured on anaphylaxis. And I just entered the fellowship program. We started in July. I absolutely knew nothing about it. Uh, but I do remember my first slide, A, B, C, adrenaline, Benadryl, and corticosteroids. And it's now, how many years later, still the same slide, the treatment hasn't changed a whole lot. But what has changed a whole lot is the diagnosis. And my topic today is going to be on idiopathic anaphylaxis. And I just think about that now. Uh, this was an iconic study when it first came out. And I'll show you the slides. But it's, it's, uh, it's self-contradictory, isn't it? Because uh, anaphylaxis, allergic reaction, requires an allergen. But we know now uh, that anaphylaxis, although it can be an allergic reaction, isn't always an allergic reaction and doesn't always uh, require an allergen. And I, I wouldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you it's a very happy time uh, to be an anaphylactologist today. Uh, we, uh, for the first time, have competing uh, industry to give us funds. Uh, for a long time, we had only one automatic epinephrine injector. Uh, we now have more coming, actually. So research uh, funded by pharma is booming. Uh, in addition, uh, there are now four guidelines. The next guideline I just finished Sunday with the first draft. Uh, it, it will be submitted very shortly to the Academy and College, and then sent to, uh, for publication. Uh, and that's going to be, uh, it is a tome. Uh, it, it's, it's like a book chapter, but it, it's going to be, uh, a, uh, I think, an iconic guideline uh, that will assist us in the management of patients. So it, it's really fun uh, to be involved in this particular part of uh, our subspecialty. Here are the guidelines, I think, yeah, that are coming out, and the NIAID the last one that we did was 2010. This one hopefully will be out by 2015. And even more so, have any of you read this book? Are you all aware of this? Um, 
you might, you, you, you know Alan Weinberg, and most of you guys know Alan, don't you? Uh, Alan was at uh, the National Jewish. Uh, he's an allergist there, a wonderful guy. Uh, and he sent me this book, uh, because he knows my interest, to review uh, for publication. It's a novel. And it's really a great novel. I, I, I would recommend it to any of you to read. Uh, I, I, it, it's very suspenseful. It has a surprise ending. Uh, and uh, I, I proofed it for uh, reality about anaphylaxis. And it's not great, but pretty good in, the, in the reality terms. The other thing about anaphylaxis, how many of you have seen the, the survey, Anaphylaxis in America? Have you, have you read that? Anybody familiar with it? How many of you have seen the survey Asthma in America? Asthma in America, you know? And uh, Allergy in America, you, you know? Okay. Well, this is the same group, the same company we hired to do anaphylaxis in America. And what they did, use the same technique for this study as they used for Asthma in America and Allergy in America. And it was really astounding. If you ask people, if they had anaphylaxis, 7.7% of a randomized population that we assayed by photo answered they had anaphylaxis. It's a huge number, right? Well, if you took that and you made them fit these criteria, they had to have multi-system involvement, they had to go to the hospital, and they had to feel like they were going to die. One, it's really 1.6 rather than 1.5. 1.6% of the population survey had experienced one of these episodes. So that's an astounding number, uh, and it's far higher than anything we had ever anticipated in the past. And the other good news, at least for allergists, is that in every um, industrialized country in, in the world where this has been looked at, the incidence is growing. Uh, this is a Mayo Clinic study. I showed it, but there's more than this one. Uh, in 1990, you know, they have this little Framingham-like community uh, that they do their epidemiologic research uh, in. And this was in 1990. You can see the last one came out in 2000 some odd. Uh, and you can see the steady red line trend upwards. This has been shown in England France, Australia as well, and there's more than one study in the United States. So the incidence, like every other allergic disease, is increasing. But the increase, if you look at the slope, is higher for anaphylaxis than any other allergic disease. This is my mentor, uh, Roy Patterson, now deceased, but uh, he published the first series of idiopathic anaphylaxis uh, ever. And uh, at that time, uh, it, it was quite shocking uh, because you, you always thought that if you had anaphylaxis, there was an allergen involved. But he studied these patients <clears throat> very intensively and, 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 and he published a series of patients where they could not find the cause. Uh, we followed that with the second series and, and the index case was really quite interesting. It was a nurse uh, who had experienced several episodes. And at that time, there, we worried about factitial anaphylaxis because people do induce anaphylaxis themselves, as a form of Munchausen's, by surreptitiously taking an allergen that they know they're allergic to uh, to be seen by the medical community and admitted. Uh, and so we put her in a room. And um, Lynn, you're young enough remember the rice, peach, lamb diet. This is what we used to put people on who had chronic urticaria to see if it was food related. Uh, and we put her on a rice, peach, lamb diet in the hospital. But furthermore, furthermore, we put a medical student in the bed next to her. At that time, we used two bed hospital rooms. Uh, and uh, the medical student was to keep an eye on this lady so that she didn't surreptitiously induce it. So we watched her. Uh, you couldn't do this. An IRP would never let you do this. We had hidden cameras. And uh, she, she didn't take anything. 
and she experienced two well-defined hypotensive episodes of anaphylaxis while under observation. Had I known what I know now, I think I would have been able to discern why. But I didn't know what I know now, so it was a big puzzle. And we published that case. And all of these patients um, were like that. And, and you know, one thing we discovered new is that when we caught them during the event, several of them who had profound hypotension had hypocompetentemia along with them. And it wasn't until a few years later uh, when the Hopkins group who hospitalized people and put them in intensive care and did an uh, insect sting challenge to prove that venom immunotherapy was uh, effective and it, it was blinded. So they restudied people who did receive placebo instead of immunotherapy and developed profound cases of anaphylaxis and they all had hypercomplementemia. So it opened up a whole new phlogistic pathway to be involved. And in fact, 7% of people who die in anaphylaxis die from disseminated intravascular coagulation, not from shock, not from airway destruction. So he has published well over a thousand cases, and this would be a way of classifying anaphylaxis now if you look at the World Allergy Organization classification, uh, which I really don't like, but, but which is the common parlance today. This is taken from Estelle Simons, and they classify anaphylaxis as immunologic and non-immunologic. There's a pointer on the... Uh, oh, is there a pointer? The uh, mouse. Oh, yeah, the mouse. Good. Okay. Yeah, thanks. There we go. Okay. Immunologic and non-immunologic. And then um, what's sort of left over is idiopathic. And we have the largest series of patients ever published um, well over a thousand now, where we looked at people who were referred to us. Um, and it's an adult skewed population because I'm an internist and um, I don't like kids. Uh, so so <laughs> we, we, we have, I, I practice with some very good pediatric allergists. And so the real little ones I send to them. So this is adult skewed. But 61% of our population is idiopathic. It's a lot. Uh, then in our population, food and drugs, like everything else, come in second. And if you look at kids, it's a little bit different. If you look at kids, by far, food dominates. But still, there are some idiopathic anaphylactic patients uh, that in, in, in childhood. If you look at gender, <clears throat> Anaphylaxis is a female disease, uh, probably related to hormones. Uh, because if you look at animal models of anaphylaxis and you add female hormones to the mixture, uh, the uh, LD50 uh, goes up and the threshold dose goes down. And if you look at the incidence in children, and it, ours is a little skewed, but a, as you get as you get older, and I'll show you in a minute, uh, the incidence of females predominant starts around the time of puberty and ends around the time of menarche when male and females become the same. Uh, but female predominance is true in all things, all of, and especially in idiopathic anaphylaxis. Um, the characteristics of idiopathic anaphylaxis, the symptoms are identical to every other form. There's an abundance of atopic individuals. Now, one would theorize that maybe that's because there's a hidden allergen somewhere. We simply miss it. And that could, that could possibly be true. Uh, but I don't think that's the major reason. So what we did to, to test the hypothesis is we took patients with idiopathic anaphylaxis, our series. And we divided them into four groups. Those who had hay fever, allergic rhinitis, and positive skin tests. Those who had totally negative skin tests were totally idiopathic. Those who had asthma and positive skin tests, and those who had intrinsic asthma. And we found that in the idiopathic anaphylactic patients, the cytokine profile, IL-4, IL-13, was identical, even though they didn't have detectable allergy, 
even though they didn't have detectable allergy, to hay fever patients who had elevated cytokine uh, profile, TH2 profile. So we think that in part, and I'm going to show you other theories of pathogenesis as we go along, but we think in part the cytokine profile determines that. Um, here are the other observations on pathogenesis. Uh, Mark Dykowitz has described two cases in the literature who had the uh, classic uh, autologous skin test positive uh, uh, and uh, IgG against the alpha receptor of IgE, which is associated with chronic idiopathic urticaria and mast cell granulation. And he postulated uh, that the, this case is related to that. That's not been confirmed. Uh, Lester Grammer at Northwestern, my alma mater, uh, looked at activated T cells. Uh, she didn't classify them into TH2, TH1, but found that people with idiopathic anaphylaxis baseline had increased cytokine secretion and a, and a uh, lower threshold for PHA stimulation. Uh, we found the cytokine profile increased L4, 5, and 13. And then um, we're going to talk about that more later, uh, which I think is, if I had to pick two advances that were uh, added to the knowledge of our field, it's the determination that mutations, point mutations in the in, in, in kit, for the mast cell receptor, uh, growth receptor, uh, can account for idiopathic anaphylaxis, and there are a number of them that we'll talk about in detail. So if you look at this graphically, you would have a mast cell here. The cytokine milieu uh, will aid uh, in uh, degranulation if it's a TH2. Antibody against the IgE receptor. Uh, and abnormalities in kit point mutations, and then activated T cells, and then the hidden allergen hypothesis. The hidden allergen hypothesis um, was looked at in one study uh, from Mayo, uh, where um, they had a group of patients with idiopathic anaphylaxis and negative skin tests to commercial food extracts. And what they did was take fresh fruit uh, uh, and retest them. And 7% of that population, I can't recall the number, had positive tests to fresh food and not uh, to um, commercial extracts. And they propounded the thought that we just don't pick up the allergen with our standard food test. Um, we've looked at that hypothesis and haven't been able to confirm that high a number, but, but occasionally we do see that. Uh, and it's quite interesting, uh, we're going to talk in detail about what I think is the most elegant study in the last 10 years in allergy immunology uh, uh, from Scott Commons and uh, Thomas Platt Mills, uh, in which he looked at uh, delayed reactions to meat and found that fresh meat, but not commercial extracts, uh, show reactivity. Uh, and we're going to show you that data as we go along. Do these original studies uh, appreciate the, what Platts Mills has discovered with delayed anaphylaxis, with, or with everybody who had anaphylaxis in these early definitions have immediate reactions? They all had immediate, not, not all, but it, it's quite interesting. I, I'm going to, we've worked with Tom, and we've looked at our population, I'm going to share that data with you, because where I live is, is the endemic area. Um, and I had seen patients who six hours after eating meat, four hours, had this. I just didn't have the uh, wherewithal or the, uh, the uh, sechel, as you and I would call it, uh, to uh, come to that conclusion. Uh, but the way that Thomas Platt's mill came about this discovery, I'm going to show you, which is a tremendous uh, uh, elegant thought process. So. Two new things have changed our approach. Galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, or alpha-gal, mast cell activating syndromes. I'm going to spend the next few slides discussing that. But uh, I, I have to show the picture of Thomas and Scott. Uh, uh, I, I, I've had the pleasure of visiting them, uh, speaking at the institution and looking at their work in, in this. And, uh, it, you know, it's just a classic example of how good minds can do things uh, and how epiphany uh, can add to our knowledge. Now, this is Amblyoma americana, which is a lone star tick. Uh, and, and, and I want to tell you that the work 
has been done in Lone Star ticks, but that's not the only tick that does this. And I'll show you some other ones later. And, and, and I, I don't think you're, I think you're not free of this disease here. I think we're going to see it in every corner of the United States. And, and the concept of pathogens that bite you, that make you sensitive as cross-reactivity occurs, is going to grow. So here's how this happened. Uh, this is the volunteer state. Uh, and uh, this is the weird state. Uh, and um, yeah, I have to tell you, down south, we're all conservatives. I, I know up here you're much more liberal, but uh, I couldn't resist that. Uh, we cut off your hand if you smoke pot. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, this is, <laughs> if you got an ear, I'll fix it. This is, uh, this is the where anaphylaxis to cetuximab occurred. Uh, it occurred in my state, but it didn't occur in Boston, and it didn't occur in California. So uh, the, 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 the uh, farm company commissioned uh, Scott to look at this. And what happened was he developed a, a, an in vitro Lisa test. And then he set his lab assistant to look, to Google what's different in Tennessee than in California and in um, Boston. And he Googled. And what he found was, whoops. Well, how do I go backwards here? There we go. No, that's four. There we go. What he found was that the distribution of the tick was this on Google looking at the map was what the difference was, the only thing he could detect. So then they looked at this mouse line where the monoclonal antibody was formed. <coughs> it's a very unusual mouse line. It is a, a mouse that makes the enzyme that allows you to make galactose <coughs> alpha-1,3 galactose or alpha-gal. And it's found on the FAB segment of cetuximab in the monoclonal antibody. It's the only monoclonal antibody that has it. This particular antigen <coughs> is found in all non-primate mammals. And it's the major antigen that prevents xenotransplantation, so that you and I have naturally occurring IgG and IgM antibodies against it. Uh, and, and that's why we can't take um, a, uh, a, a xenotransplant. So it looks like that. And the first <coughs> paper came out in 2009. The 24 patients with a delayed reaction after eating milk, they had negative prick test to commercial antigens, they had positive prick and ID to fresh meat, uh, and it was against alpha-gal. And that's how this thing got discovered. And uh, this is IgE against alpha-gal on the bottom axis, and IgE to the saliva of American of the tick. They correlate, and this is what happens where you see the uh, red arrows to the patient's uh, IgE anti-alpha-gal with a, with a bite. And what we did, he called me, and he knew we had this store of uh, idiopathic anaphylaxis patients. So we, we called in everyone we could find, and we send them the blood. And what happened was about 5 and now up to 15 percent of our patient population who we had thought were idiopathic for years, actually, some of them, um, and we missed the history. We just didn't pick it up, uh, had anti gal We took these patients and we took them off mammalian meat. 
their anti-alpha-gal titers go down, and they don't have any more anaphylaxis. Uh, the only one that we found that continued to have anaphylaxis had anti-alpha-gal and systemic mastocytosis. We didn't diagnose the systemic mastocytosis until we got rid of the alpha-gal and we found they continued to have it. We did a bone marrow. Uh, but there are other ticks. Uh, for example, they've been found in uh, France, Oxidetrocinus in Australia, Oxides monocyclus, and they're going to see more. Uh, this was the result of our study, and uh, most are sensitized to mammalian derived gelatin as well. So uh, we, we, we ask patients not to eat jello, uh, be careful about gelatin. They seem to be able to tolerate vaccines with gelatin. We've never found any problem there. Uh, and uh, some of them are sensitive to milk. Uh, and, and we see that in kids, maybe, who get urticaria. And, and this is quite interesting. There's a cat, uh, uh, alpha gallo cat, but it's fel D5, and it's not allergenic for asthma. So that these patients, even though cats have this antigen, uh, don't, it, it does not cause asthma. Uh, food challenges are a way to confirm it. But the problem is it's inconsistent. It doesn't happen every time because the amount of alpha-gal in different meat is different. Uh, and it, it, we found in, in where we live, a lot of people uh, kill deer. And they... Uh, brine the meat, high salt concentration for 24 hours. If they brine the meat, it destroys the alpha gal and they can eat it. Fattier cuts of beef are more likely uh, to uh, cause a positive reaction. Uh, and the reactions can change as their level of sensitivity changes. They've been stung by, by, bitten by a tick, the reaction can become positive. The next big... Uh, Before you move on sure. Tonight. Does anybody explain why it's delayed anaphylaxis? I know Platts Mills just did an oral challenge study and fed yeah. these people meat, and it was like six hours, not 30 minutes. Why is that? We don't know the answer to that, but we think that it, it's related to the fact that these are fatty antigens, and they're hooked onto chylomicrons. And chylomicrons are short and slow, and that's Platts Mills' hypothesis. Uh, that's not been proven. We don't know. But it is a, a very characteristic uh, uh, clinical pattern. Uh, and we, we now, where we live, we draw alpha gal on every patient who comes in with anaphylaxis. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's like 15% uh, will have a positive alpha gal. Anybody here seen this? My son has it. Is it urgent? Yeah. No, uh, I'm affected by a tick and now he can't eat it. Does Platts Mills have this himself? I don't think so. I thought it looked in the literature and that he had it himself as so I looked into it. He may. He hasn't confessed that to me yet. Uh, did, where, did, where did your son get it? He, he lives in Lynchburg now. Okay. And uh, he got it when he was back there. He had a tick bite and then all of a sudden he started having trouble because he's a when he was young he would never eat anything other than red meat and now he can't eat red meat at all. So it's sort of... We have ticks here, does anybody know? Mm -hmm. yeah, what, yeah, what. I don't know what kind of ticks we have, but yeah, they're here. Well, yeah, you have ticks here. Uh, I, I think this is going to be a huge area. It's going to extend beyond what we know now. And, and, and the other thing I think you have to be careful, and I meant to tell you, it's all mammalian meat. Like squirrels, for, for example. Your son had me, I needed to mention that to you. Bison, any red meat. Now, uh, it, it, some red meat are more likely to do it than others. For example, pork kidney. Uh, in Germany, where they have this now as well, uh, pork kidney will do it. But some of these people can eat beef. So it's a little tricky. Now, now the other people who have made the most outstanding uh, observation affecting what, what I do are our former, uh, my former resident, uh, Dean Metcalf at the NIH, and Sim Aiken. Uh, and Sim trained under, under Dean. Uh, Dean, uh, when I went back, I left my fellowship program in opened uh, uh, the allergy program at the University of Tennessee. I, I, I walked into the office the first day and there was a young man sitting in, in my office and uh, that, that young man was Dean Metcalf. 
uh, and Dean spent six, six weeks with me as a preceptor because my chief of medicine wanted me to have a student when I walked in the door. Uh, and Dean published three papers in six weeks in Jackie. Uh, I knew right then and there that, that, that he would be uh, one of the leading members of our field. So a little history. Uh, this is POTS syndrome. Have you, any people seen POTS syndrome? It's a weird syndrome. Postural at Vanderbilt is where they have this POTS syndrome center for the United States. Uh, postural tachycardia syndrome, a disabling condition in females. And uh, this was a case that was diagnosed as POTS syndrome that had marked elevation of history. And that was the first, in quotes, mast cell activating disorder, quote from that paper uh, that was in the cardiology literature in 2005. The first in, from an allergist actually was not in the allergy literature. It was Sim Aikens, and it was published in blood. Uh, and he had 12 patients with idiopathic anaphylaxis. And this is the point, they had negative biopsies for systemic mastocytosis. They didn't meet the WHO criteria, which I'll show you. But five had evidence of one or more minor criteria for mastocytosis, and three had the 816V point mutation in KIT. Sim's second report, uh, was the first to come out in allergy literature. It was an abstract a year later. Uh, he had eight patients with elevated baseline tryptase from 15.4 to 36.5. Now, back then, elevated serum tryptase was anything above 20, right? Uh, now, it's anything above 11.7, so it's changed. But um, back then, he recognized that 15.4 would be elevated. Flushing was the most frequent reported symptoms. Two of the eight patients had anaphylaxis and hematologic parameters were remarkable in all patients. 816, the mutation was asso uh, uh, associated with mastocytosis was not detectable in any patients. So these patients didn't have mastocytosis, but they had formed fruits on biopsy. These are, the di these are the criteria to make a diagnosis of systemic mastocytosis. The major criteria is multifocal dense aggregates of the bone marrow. The minor are spindle-shaped mast cells, 816 mutation, positives for CD1, 17, 2, and 25, serum tryptase greater than 20. Uh, and three minor and one major allows you to make it. I was very embarrassed uh, because of uh, well, I saw a patient who was referred to me um, when, when they moved to Atlanta. They'd already seen two allergies in Atlanta uh, and had terrible, life-threatening anaphylactic events. And this guy, I, I see a lot of anaphylaxis. This guy scared me. Um, he had serum tryptase done during the events, were well over 100. Serum tryptase baseline on four occasions when I saw him was five and under. He had five episodes while under my care. Baseline serum, uh, serum tryptase, three other occasions, was five. Uh, huge uh, elevations. Um, and, uh, you know, I recall one night, the wife called me from the emergency room in tears, and he said, my husband's going to die. He's going to die. And, and, and you know, I got there. He, he, he still had not survived, uh, and I thought he was going to die. So... Two weeks later, they came to the office, and, and you know, the wife said, yeah, I love you, Dr. Lieberman, but send me somewhere, okay? So I gave him some options. I, I gave him sim I gave him, I tracked, the you NIH know, had a protocol, so I told him about Dean, um, and I said, you can go to Mayo. So they said, I, I'd rather go to Mayo. So we went to Mayo, and lo and behold, I did not do a bone marrow on this guy, because his some tryptases were fine. Well, why would I do a bone marrow? They, you know, you go to Mayo, you got to do something you didn't do. So what did they do? They did a bone marrow. They had mastocytosis. The, the, the take-home point from this is that if you have a case like this, and I'll show you the work up later, you cannot avoid doing a bone marrow just because 
you have a normal, uh, you have a normal tryptase. These are all the synonyms for mast cell activating syndrome. And this is the mechanism of how a point mutation in KIT, which is the mast cell growth factor, can account for this disease. That's codon 816 on the intracellular portion domain of KIT. Now, understand that if you look at this, there are other point mutations which are also growth factors. This is for gastrointestinal uh, uh, tumors and there are others as well. So it's a typical um, tyrosine kinase receptor growth factor abnormality. And what it does is it autoactivates. When it autoactivates, you get the granulation, you get mast cell growth, and they grow into spindle-shaped mast cells, and uh, you get uh, uh, mast cell proliferation. But here's the point. There are other mutations, just like I think there are going to be other ticks. That's not the only mutation that causes anaphylaxis. This is from the GI literature. And they found one, uh, they found several, but glutamine at 252, for example. Now, now the take home point here is that although imatinib will not work on the 816V, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Imatinib will work on some of these point mutations, so it's very essential if you have a patient with severe episodes uh, that you look for them if possible and you can, you can get them done uh, uh, or even empirically try uh, imatinib if they're negative in 8.6V. So are there clinical means uh, by which uh, we can uh, distinguish a patient from idiopathic anaphylaxis non cloned by that I mean uh, they don't have a point mutation uh, and, uh, versus uh, idiopathic anaphylaxis clone. So in the clone, uh, these are the mast cell activating or mast cell, uh, or, or mast cell cytosis. Tryptase levels were higher. In the idiopathic, they had higher IgE levels or more atopy. Urticaria was more prominent in the purely idiopathic without mast cell activating uh, syndrome. And this is a study on that, 83 patients divided into clonal and non-clonal, and pre syncopal or syncopal episodes in the absence of urticaria was characteristic for the clonal. Urticaria was in the non-clonal. Uh, and a higher frequency of cardiovascular problem uh, and, and, and insect-related things, hymenopter-related uh, problems uh, in the clone. Now, now, the reason that they didn't get skin is if you have, if you could go into shock, if you have cardiovascular collapse, you, you can't get blood vessels to the skin, right? So if you can't get blood vessels to the skin, you're not going to get urticaria and you're not going to get flush. So what happens with these patients is they just sort of feel bad and they go into shock. I have a patient, a wonderful guy, teaches English at Ole Miss University, which is a 50-mile jaunt from, from where I live. Uh, and he's also a, uh, a movie guy, so he writes reviews for uh, movies. And uh, he has mastic cytosis. And his episodes, he just is he, he's walking around and he just goes into shock five, ten minutes. Uh, he, he, he teaches a class, and when he teaches the class, he hands out EpiPens to his automatic epinephrine injectors, I'm sorry, uh, to his students, and he says, if I pass out, and I've got a movie of this. It was on PBS, by, by the way. PBS uh, did an did a, 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 a hours-long show on anaphylaxis, idiopathic anaphylaxis, got a movie on this, it's really quite traumatic. So these people, like the gentleman I said that came from Atlanta, are, are very dramatic in their manifestations. These are the data. If you look at uh, clone here, nine clone in uh, white, skin manifestations, cardiovascular manifestations, respiratory, GI, and others. The other uh, 
article on this. That was from Spain. Uh, this is from Boston, from uh, Britain, and it's uh, Sim and uh, and uh, Monica uh, Mariana Cassells to make it, and it was came out with uh, a uh, gastroenterologist because these patients are referred not to allergists, gastroenterologists, uh, because they have abdominal pain, uh, diarrhea, and. They're like what I would call a fuzzy group of patients. They ha in yellow, you see the weird things that they have. Headache, they have poor concentration of memory. This was first described by Frank Austin in the New England Journal, where these people had affective disorders, uh, uh, unable to uh, 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 use logic to solve problems. Uh, and they had biopsy findings of mast cells in gut, but not biopsy findings of mast cells in the bone. Uh, and in addition to that, they would have anaphylaxis, a small percent at the bottom, uh, but they would flush uh, and, 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 and they would have other manifestations that you have to be alert to. These patients, and the reason you need to diagnose them, respond to anti-mediator therapy. They respond to antihistamines, antitrines, etc. So in conclusion, Male sex, flushing rather than urticaria, GI symptoms, syncope, headache, CNS symptoms are the warning symptoms that you need to look at for clonality. And the criteria for the diagnosis of mast cell activating disorder, this is not mass systemic mast cell cytosis, are absence of primary or secondary causes of mast cell granulation, symptoms characteristic, validated marker of granulation serum tryptase, plasma histamine, urine histamine, prostaglandin. Some cases have been reported with prostaglandin D2 in the urine or prostaglandin alpha F2 in the urine who are negative for tryptase, negative for histamine. So you, we check that as well occasion. And this produced a new classification of anaphylaxis, which I sort of like. Uh, there's a whole bunch of us that got together. I, uh, at the good graces of Sim, uh, I mean of, uh, of, of uh, my former resident dean, uh, let me come up there and be part of the group. Uh, met in Vienna uh, and formulated this uh, EACI accepted uh, criteria. Typical symptoms, substantial increase in mast cell mediators. What is substantial? This comes from uh, Larry Schwartz, uh, a retrospective review of his cases. Uh, it's 20% increase plus two nanograms. So if their baseline is 10, 20% of that would be two, plus two is 14. So that's what he considers, based on retrospective analysis, uh, a, a significant increase. And a response to agents attenuating the production of or activities of these mediators. Based on that, you have mast cell activating disorders at the top, divided into type one, that's classic anaphylaxis, penicillin, hymenoptera, uh, monoclonal disease, mast cell activating syndromes, and idiopathic anaphylaxis like that. And the primary mast cell activating syndromes are clonal and non-clonal, and idiopathic represents the rest. Looking at that now, our 61% uh, that I showed you on the original slide in our last series has been reduced to 48% because the rest had alpha-gal, systemic mastocytosis, and mast cell activated disorders. So what does it mean to us? So here's what, this is not a consensus Work up. This is my thoughts as to how I go about looking at a patient who comes in. Look at their symptoms. If they have flush or GI symptoms, I do a workup for carcinoid VIP omas. If they have shock without urticaria, they do the vessel activating syndrome. If they have urticaria androedema, think about idiopathic. These are the tests. We have found about three cases of uh, VIP masquerading as anaphylaxis 
uh, carcinoid, uh, but there's plenty of others in the gut that secretes, uh, that, uh, that secrete pancreatitis, neurokine, et cetera. And what you need to get is a chromogranin A. Uh, that is a pre-molecule that, 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 that is synthesized before uh, a carcinoid. It's almost always elevated in the viapiomas. And an octreotide CAT scan, uh, if you have any elevation to locate the tumor. Very rare, but you'll run across one in a lifetime. For vasocytosis, as I said, vasoactivating disorder, uh, we do uh, tryptase, histamine in the plasma, and urine, uh, PGD2, uh, it, uh, if the others are negative, uh, alpha gal, we skin test the fresh foods, and then do a bone marrow. So when do I do a bone marrow? Uh, I learned that very uh, salient lesson from Bayo. Uh, these are all the typical ones that you would use. And I do them now, even when the trip base is normal. If I've not ever found a cause, I can't control the episodes uh, because uh, you can't trust the serum triptase uh, to rule out the diagnosis. When you have idiopathic anaphylaxis, how do we treat? There's no perfect treatment. Um, and, and some of these uh, I've not been able to control. But these are all the things that have been reported in the literature to cause, uh, uh, to create a beneficial effect in given patients. Uh, there are no series. These are all like case reports. Uh, and, and all of the work, and what we do is start with the anti-mediator drugs. I like ketotifen. Uh, Y'all use ketotifen here for anything? Uh, we get it from England. It's cheaper than for getting it from Canada. It's about two-thirds the price. Uh, it's at a place called masters.com. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a massive degranulating prevention agent and a very potent antihistamine. Uh, we have anecdotal responses to reports of anecdotal. Omelizumab is, is good. Uh, the, the Northwestern group uses prednisone high dose, 60 milligrams, and paper off at about uh, 6 to 12 months. Uh, and then we start if necessary, sort of like to deal with allergic problem pulmonary aspergillosis. Uh, and, and they get good results, as you know, the mass cell population is shrunk uh, with steroids. Uh, and all these other things have been used as well. But I think the most exciting contribution is going to come from tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, because as we develop new ones that fit into the pocket of these other point mutations, and when we develop one that fits into the pocket of 816B, we're going to be able to control these patients. So in conclusion, idiopathic anaphylaxis is a subcategory of vessel activating disorders. It can only be definitely distinguished from, uh, from uh, uh, cystic mastocytosis or uh, by a bone marrow, but there are several clinical features that point towards a, bone, a cloning uh, disorder. And the instance uh, of, uh, of the diagnosis of idiopathic anaphylaxis is shrinking uh, as we uncover the cause. And with that, I thank you very much for attending. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Phil. Questions? Can't all be that clear. <laughs> your, your slide, just a couple back on when to do a bone marrow, because that question does come up a lot. Can you, so if you have any of those criteria, you will you will go ahead and do a bone marrow or you have some combination of? I, I, I'll do it if I have found a cause. Uh, and and, and you know, if they're having significant problems, uh, I, I won't have to do it. The, the key to doing what is really important um, is to have a good pathologist that you, that you know is knowledgeable because uh, several patients that we've seen uh, have had negative bone marrows, but we redo them uh, uh, to a positive. Uh, and and uh, we're very liberal to do one because of our experience. And you have a hematologist who does it for you? Or? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a hemop guy. Uh, one, or, or we, we train together. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, I find these, they don't like to do them much anymore. Uh, they're labor intensive, uh, remuneration diminished. Uh, so you have to find one that's willing to do it, and it's good. Yeah. 
Yeah, we have a pretty good one, but it's fairly strict about using the published criteria that, uh, um, uh, and when, when they don't fit that, it's harder to get it done. So. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Uh, and th th that published criteria is going to be changed. It's in the process of being revised now, so it'll get a little easier. Uh, but um, the, the, I think as a clinical tool, it's going to become much more important as we develop more uh, Harrison County inhibitors, especially when we get the 816B inhibitor. Yes. You talk about skin testing and then using fresh fruit extracts. And you never, do you ever use IgE to exclude allergy, or do you just keep testing and until you're comfortable? Sure, specific IgE. Yeah. Um, I don't for this particular condition, but we do for food allergy, of course, uh, and you know to to look at uh, components and to look at. Um, when to do a challenge and what, you know, that, but for this group of patients, no. Um, I, I, you know, you, 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 we tested 50 something foods um, and uh, it, it's too expensive. And the times that I've looked at, you know, the ones that are uh, maybe salient for that patient, uh, I've never found one in vitro uh, that was positive, which in vivo was negative. So I know I know you know, but I, I would argue with anyone who did. You, um, yes. on, on this side, you, you don't do intradermals to to food. No, no. no. Uh, but Tom Mills. The question, uh, the question was, do we do intradermals? Uh, yeah, th th this is one of the um, one of the foundations of skin testing is you don't skin test intradermal in food. But really, there's no, I mean, when you look at the literature, it's based on a couple of anaphylactic reactions. Uh, but it's just like doing intradermals to hymenoptera. There's nothing wrong with an intradermal test. It's just a level of sensitivity. So Tom Fletch Mills bucked that tradition to establish Ig sensitivity when these patients said he did do uh, intradermals to foods in this group. Um, we don't, because classically that's the way we're trained. But but I I, I would wager that if we uh, and, and we do them to inhalants, I I, I believe they are clinically relevant, uh, regardless of uh, the few studies in the literature that uh, indicate that they may not be. Uh, it's simply a dose response phenomenon, just like for hymenoptera. Uh, so so he did intradermal safely in this group of patients. Anything else? So how does uh, how does this slide on when to do a bone marrow match with what we're doing here? Pretty much the same. Do you use the REMA score at all? No, uh, I, I'm familiar with it, but I don't. Uh, that it's, it's the same principles, and yeah. that's what we've been going off. It's been 100% accurate for me. Has it been? Um, yeah, it's been very accurate. It may just be dumb luck, but you know, if, if with our hematologists, if you show them, you know that, that they usually will go ahead and do a bone. Oh, okay. Uh, who is had a who, who, people that have a negative score set for bone marrow biopsies? Mm -hmm. They didn't have clonal disease, you know, mm -hmm. cell activation syndrome. Yeah, but obviously. So, so you've also, got some biopsies who don't have a high enough. Yes, score. if they've been negative on their REMA score. So uh, it's basically the same criteria you brought up there. So that's interesting. Um, the, the REMA score we we haven't found worked, it's a, and, and but it's there, there are people who say who swear by it. So that's very good. I I, I have a slide on it. Uh, but but I, I, I didn't put it in because of the controversy, but uh, I'll have to take a look at it again. Yeah, it maybe dumb luck, but it's been pretty No, hard. it's probably that way. I mean, people who, um, from Spain who started that uh, are, you know, swear by it and, and still do it. Before we break up, our other new fellow this year wasn't in here to introduce himself, so I want you to stand up and do that before you put in your name. I'm sorry. Before this um, group breaks up. Uh, my name is Dan Petroni. I'm one of the uh, new allergy fellows. I'm a pediatrician uh, by training, so let's start. So uh, let's take a momentary break. As many people who can stay, and Dan's going to present uh, a case. And <laughs>
So this is a case I saw about a year ago when I was a senior resident. So the chief complaint is anaphylaxis. The patient is a 30-year-old female who presents with recurrent episodes of anaphylaxis. The first episode occurred while the patient was free climbing, that means climbing a mountain without a rope, um, in Yosemite with her friends. And then she says she must have passed out because she woke up in the hospital with no recollection of the event. For the paramedics on the scene who arrived within 15 minutes of the accident, patient had fallen 20 feet onto the rocks below. It was known to have whole body to carry a, an audible strider with dyspnea. Uh, epinephrine was administered, which was all the strider, and she was taken to the local hospital. At the local hospital, she was found to have some several stable vertebral fractures that were repaired without any incident. Two years later, the patient was bouldering, which is kind of climbing up a bunch of like boulders up in Joshua Tree, slipped and fell between two boulders and sprained her ankle. After the injury, she developed severe hives and dyspnea. EMS was called again and treated her with epinephrine, which resolved her symptoms. Sent to the emergency department who discharged her with an EpiPen. Over the next two years, any injury would result in similar anaphylactic type reactions, which would resolve with epinephrine. These re this all happened a while back ago, and these uh, 
reaction had become so common she would use epinephrine inhalers instead of that because it was, she, saw, she didn't like jabbing herself so much. Um, you gotta stop, can yeah. I stop you right here? Did, did, did any of y'all know how many puffs of an epinephrine inhaler one would have to take to equal 0.3 cc's of epinephrine given either subcute, actually, or you know, just How many puffs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot. Four. 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 Uh, for uh, anaphylactic, so we strongly advise, of course, against it. Yeah. Um, she denies that any sort of exercise-specific foods or medications are associated with these episodes. I think she denied that exercise. <laughs> well, wrong way. specifically, she can exercise without a problem. If she doesn't uh, injure herself, she has absolutely no problems whatsoever. It's only when she gets injured. So, I mean, and the injuries can be very minor, like her stepping off a curb wrong and kind of twist your ankle, she'll get these, these episodes. Um, so past medical, just some exercise-induced asthma as a teenager that's now greatly resolved. Um, family medical history, patients adopted with unknown family history. An exam is basically normal, except for a significant dematographism, some of the most impressive that I've ever seen, as well as a pressure to carry it. Um, and that's kind of, I have more information, but I'll let you go off. Okay, I've okay. seen so many abbreviations. <laughs> <laughs> no acute distress, normal cephalic atraumatic, cleared ascultation, bilaterally, regular rain rhythm, soft, non tender bowels, non tender abdomen with normal, hepa no hepatosplenomegaly. Yeah, very short notes that are nice yes. to say. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, recurrent idiopathic anaphylaxis at this point, in time, yes. right? Possibly uh, associated with exercise, no known association. Person who is atopic by history and uh, asthma, I imagine you, okay, uh, and then um, whose episodes manifest by both urticaria and shock. It's a little unusual. Okay, so what would be, who's our other fe new fellow? Where's our other fellow? All right, so, so after I gave that very elegant uh, lecture, uh, what, what would be your next step right now? She was negative to the arrow allergens, um, but had a significant amount of like dramatographic type of Okay, she, okay. Yeah. Did you, did, and this is one where I might have done search specific allergy, but it's not that big a deal. Mm. Did, did you skin test the foods? No, I don't think okay. so. Okay, all right. Uh, then did, did you get a, uh, a um, triptase? Yes. Baseline? Yes. And what was it? 16. 16, okay. So statistically speaking, with the baseline, who's our other fellows? Raise your hand. All right. I got, got, got too many. They're, they're multiplied. Bill, you're growing them. It's terrible. We've only got three. Um, so raise your hands again. Separate second from third year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we'll, we'll start with the second years. Second, second years? Okay. Um, what, was the, what was the trip days? 16. 16. Statistically speaking, what are the odds that she has mesocytosis? Well, the triptase, the baseline triptase level elevated, so that's one point in her favor. Right. Um, we're talking about systemic mastocytosis versus clonal versus non. She's female, so that might go against a clonal mastocytosis. Okay. Um, but the presentation of um, you know, the urticaria and the 
anaphylactic like event, I'd certainly could go along with that as well. Good. Now, where is this case being presented? In an academic center. Yes. Okay. By a fellow. Yep. So you know it's got to be what? Weird. Yes. <laughs> All right. It's not going to be something. So, so statistically speaking, I would say since it's being presented to me, I think, uh, I'd have to say she's got mastocytosis right now. So the next step I would do would be a bone marrow. Bone marrow. Okay. Did you do a bone marrow? Yeah. So she had CK mutation. She had uh, spindle spindle like mast cells. She had pretty much all the classics of it. And um, with Stop. okay. <laughs> How are you going to treat it? So, oh, second. Or your third year? Or your second year? Second. Yeah. Um, I guess if she's, all the mutations negative and has more of the, well. She was 8.6 feet positive. She, she, she has it. Okay, so she has it. She, she has it. So, um, you could try high dose prednisone. At first, you do tyrosine kinase inhibitor. I just pretty soon. Okay, anybody else want to try anything else? Put it on daily antihistamines, maybe uh, a Lucas as well. Uh, and then complete the evaluation with uh, bone density. Uh, look for maybe some abdominal imaging. Like look for why, why would he do a bone density? What, what, is, what is it? I wouldn't do a bone density. Dexas what would I do? What would I do? A Dexas. A de well, I wouldn't do a DEXA scan. You know what I would do? Uh, I, I would do a bone scan, centigrity. Why would I do a bone scan, centigrity, centigrity over a DEXA scan? Why would I do either one? You can get bone from region. What? You can get the regions in the bone or a thinning of the bone. You, you can, but you already made a diagnosis, right? So, 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 so. What's that for us? Well, I see that, that's exactly right. So the sensitivity of a bone of a technician scan in this particular case would be higher than a DEXA. I would get that and then maybe get a DEXA afterward. Because they, why do they develop osteoporosis? What's the pathogenesis? Um, I think it's really the muscle cells. I don't know exactly what it is. Just to me. Just to Yeah. Uh, and she was how old? Uh, at this presentation, she was 30. 30. I wouldn't worry, worry too much about it, but did you happen to do one? Well, when I saw her, she was in her, in her mid-40s, so this okay. is her initial presentation. And yes, she, she had kind of routine um, kind of scans, and she was a little bit osteoporotic. A little bit, okay. What's the mechanism of osteoporosis? What histamine, is, histamine. What does histamine have to activates. do with bones? Huh? Well, uh, histamine will activate uh, 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 osteoclast. Osteoclast? Yeah. Really? So Why does she only have these uh, episodes when she hurts herself? I have no idea. That's why I talked about it here. We, this, this, this persisted. Um, so she, she then progressed to unitary pigmentosa. She has, she has like whole, one, her entire trunk and back has unitary pigmentosa kind of all over. And she continues, um, and we just, she's controlled on just uh, cetirizine. One dose of cetirizine every day kind of helps controlling symptoms and ameliorates it. But if she gets to and she hurts herself, then she'll have these episodes. I don't know why she has it. Have you ever seen this before? That's why I presented it. I, I call your attention to an article recently published in the Annals of, uh, Annals of Allergy, which I reviewed and suggested it be turned down. But it did get published because uh, Galen, as you know, Galen's uh, on that is his relationship between mind and body. So it was a series, it was a case report of a patient who uh, anaphylaxed on emotional stress under observation in the office uh, of, uh, of, of an allergist. Uh, and our biopsy showed massive irregulation. So the, 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 the article goes through a very long and complicated the theory on the pathogenesis, it's how this is connected to the granulation of mass cells. I didn't understand that part, but. Uh, uh, that, that is a theory that runs through the literature. The latest article is, I think it's 